Okay, a quick one here. You're going to have a series of videos where we briefly look at evolutionary forces other than natural selection. You've seen the slide before or a slide like it. We've talked about these other evolutionary forces in the context of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. If the population is in equilibrium, then none of these forces are acting on the locus that we're interested in. <clears throat> A fifth thing that we've talked about related to equilibrium is the presence of random mating, that there's no choosing of mates with respect to the locus, that individuals are just as likely to mate with others that with any allele, not necessarily their allele or not necessarily a different allele. There's no um, selective mating related to the locus we're talking about. As you saw in the lab, here we go. As you saw in the lab, um, non-random mating does not change allele frequencies, but it changes genotype frequencies. So all by itself, non-random mating is not an evolutionary force, but it can contribute to evolution. So let's look at this one. Uh, here's a term, inbreeding. This just means mating between individuals that are closely related to each other. So this could be siblings, this could be uh, cousins, it doesn't really matter. It's a sort of general term for mating between close relatives. Uh, the most extreme form of inbreeding would be self-fertilization. We've talked about this already. Maybe plants are a good example. Uh, individuals that make both of the gametes and fertilize themselves. Okay, that'd be the most extreme case of non-random mating. All right, so let's think about the outcomes of self-fertilization uh, for one individual, and then we'll, we will apply this to the whole population. So if you're a homozygous, sorry, homozygote with both dominant alleles, here we're saying A1 instead of just big A, all of your offspring look the same. They're all homozygotes, just like you. If you're a heterozygote, we know you make two individuals that are heterozygotes just like you, and one of each type of homozygote. And then if you're a homozygote here with the other allele, again, all of your offspring look like you. All right, so let's look at a population where we have, here we go, we have, um, uh, let's see, a quarter of our population is one type of homozygote, another quarter is the other type of homozygote, and then uh, half of our population is heterozygotes. Okay. And you can see on the right that we have equal frequencies of our two alleles, A1 and A2. P and Q are both equal to 0.5. We're going to look across the generations. And what we're going to see is that with inbreeding, we see an increase in the frequency of homozygotes. And so a reduction in the frequency of heterozygotes. So in generation one, we've described the conditions. We're saying that all of the homozygotes mate with themselves and make more homozygotes. The heterozygotes mate with each other. They're going to make some homozygotes of each type and then some more heterozygotes. So in the generation after this one, all of the homozygote offspring make homozygotes. Okay, that's the 100%. A quarter of the heterozygote offspring are each type, and then only half of the heterozygote offspring are heterozygotes. And in this model, we're sort of saying that individuals are just replacing themselves as far as reproduction. Okay, uh, so if we uh, lay this on out into three and four generations, what you can see is that um, on the right, the allele frequencies aren't changing. We still have equal representation of a1 and A2, but what's changing are the genotype frequencies. We have many fewer heterozygotes than we started with and many more homozygotes. Okay, yeah, and the allele frequencies stay the same. If we have something other than self-fertilization, we get the same outcome, the loss of heterozygotes, but it's going to happen slower. Self-fertilization is the a sort of rapid a most extreme example. Okay, so we've defined evolution as change in allele frequencies. We see we don't have change in allele frequencies here. So all by itself, non-random mating 
is not an evolutionary process, um, but it can speed up evolutionary change. It can increase the rate at which uh, recessive alleles are actually visible in phenotype. So in the heterozygote, we might not be able to see the recessive allele in the phenotype. With inbreeding, we'll get more homozygote recessive individuals and we'll see that allele that might be then eliminated by natural selection. Okay, so think about what would happen in generation four if all of the A2A2 individuals were selected against, right? We'd have lots of these A1, A1s, and we'd have our heterozygotes, okay? So we'd really be drastically changing allele frequency, so Q would go way down if um, there was something deleterious, something bad about the A2A2 phenotype. All right, so inbreeding, not an evolutionary force, I should say non-random mating, not by itself an evolutionary force, but in concert with other forces like natural selection, non-random mating can make a big change in population allele frequencies over generations. All right, so our next video is genetic drift, and I'll see you there soon.